Welcome to the Outer Circle Inner Stillness, conversations and reflections on spirituality, sobriety, and the way of life that is the inner life or highly centers the inner life anyway. I'm Reese Basimio from still sort of chilly Portland, Oregon area, technically Fairview to the east of Portland, but lots of people haven't heard of Fairview, so I just say Portland. And I'm here with Christian of the House Gonzalez from the wilds of Arizona. Where yes, is it cold or hot there right now? Um, well, I mean it's cold for Arizona, but cold Arizona is still hot everywhere else. You know, like it's it's hot when it's even when it's cold here. Of standing in the sun, you still feel it for sure. But we have actually been so so fortunate this. Winter. I mean, I, I don't think we've ever been, you know, at the end of March and still have like 67 degree days. So it is just wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. That does sound really nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. last time last time I was in Arizona, it was in October. And I think it was like a nice, balmy, cool, like 82 or something. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And I was really happy coming from, again, the, the Pacific Northwest, where it was, you know, down in the you know, 40s and 50s at that time. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm crossing my fingers for a you know Pasca in the 70s, so we'll see uh, you know how that goes. We that would be unprecedented because normally it's like 94, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 sounds really good. Uh, I, I can imagine that being really welcome up here, as like our Pascas again tend to be like you know somewhere in the 40s, 50s, may, maybe 60s. So all these wonderful, eager you know catechumens descending into the duck pond <laughs> where it's still got the winter chill. And sometimes the rain. Uh, yeah, yes. I think I think the the day my the Pasca my family was baptized. It was it was raining so much, like everybody was wet before we got in the pond. So that's awesome. Yeah, so, it was like a pre baptism. It, it was. It was. Yeah. Uh, so, but it just, wasn't by immersion, so it, it wouldn't didn't count. It, it right. Was it was an excessive sprinkling, but <clears throat> we don't we don't count that. So, right. Um. Right. Could you get rained on in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? I don't know. That would, that would I'm pretty sure fun. every time you're, it rains, you are. I suppose. Yeah. When you think about it. <laughs> so <laughs> life as sacrament, I guess, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, oh, we might have to come back to that idea of what is sacrament. And so somebody was asking me, like, is an icon a sacrament? Or what's the difference between icons and sacraments? And, and that... Uh, my, my wife and I were talking about that. And I think I, well, I think I definitely need to ask, ask my priest about this a little bit more, but I think where we were coming to is something like an icon, an icon's an item. Uh, whereas, uh, like, like a holy item, a set apart item that can be used in, in worship can be used in, in Christian practice. But, but the, the sacrament as the way we understand it in, in the East is more, more of an action or more of a process or more of a relationship. I know. I think yeah. you've been around this a little bit longer. What do you What do you think? Yeah. Well, I don't know, man. It, like, because I think the all of life is meant to be lived sacramentally. You know. So I I don't know where necessarily the line always is between like sacrament and non sacrament. Um. You know, I don't know. This is, these are this is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because okay. to me i would think that like like a sacrament like the sacrament is about a participation in the life of god right like that is kind of most ultimately what what they're about um and so i guess like can icons participate in the life of god and can we participate through icons in the life of god um my answer would, to that would have to be yes you know um so i don't know that there may be like sacraments and I mean, obviously they're not in the way that, you know, like the Eucharist or baptism or confession are, but there's certainly something about them that you would not want to discard. Right. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll mull on that, but while we're mulling on that in the back of our heads, uh, for the listener who may not have heard of House Gonzalez, uh, could you say a little bit more about uh, who you are? Uh, what's your connection to orthodoxy, counseling, sobriety, healing, 
uh, what's your corner of the world there? Yeah. So um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in Arizona. Uh, as we've already said, um, I've got a private practice out here and been doing that for, um, let's see, well, I graduated from school in 2011, but then kind of worked off and on in mental health since then. Um, but I've been practicing as a marriage and family therapist since 2017, 16, 2016 or 17, I can't remember. Um, seeing mostly couples for the first few years of my career. Um, and now I've sort of been going more into seeing uh, individual adult men. Uh, that's kind of more where, I, where I've landed. Not even necessarily by plan, just kind of like has happened. So, and I, and I dig it. It's, it's, it's cool. Uh, but also I'm an Orthodox Christian. Um, maybe I should have led with that one. That's probably the more important thing about me. Um, you know, you know, it is. So I am first and foremost, somebody who is in the process of being healed and constantly having the parts of my heart that are not healed be revealed, um, which is super fun. And I also, as I live and dwell kind of in the Orthodox world, I am the director of ministry for a, a nationwide uh, pan-Orthodox youth and young adult ministry called OIM. Um, you can find us at theoim.org. Uh, and really what we're trying to do is, you know, unite efforts in Orthodox youth and young adult ministries, um, really trying to primarily focus on passing on faith as a way of life. Um, as a way of being in the world, a, a way of new humanity that, that Christ shows us. So, um, you know, we're trying to really push kind of like the importance of practices and uh, in engagement with Christ uh, in his body, the church, and then loving, by, loving our neighbors by being the best neighbors we can. So that's kind of the world that I dwell in. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. That is some um, supremely good stuff. Uh, and I'm excited about all of that. Um, By your I, prayers, man. By your prayers. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. <laughs> By yours, too. Uh, yes. Lots, lots of prayers. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I have some, some of those like client scenarios where I'm just like, wow, you're in deep. I, I don't actually know what to do. Uh, <laughs> like, Lord have mercy. Wow, I really can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, tangenting again on something else we both like. So, you know, talking about, uh, you know, internal family systems and, and I've been really enjoying that very much. And um, one of the facets I most appreciate about that model is because it's very curiosity based, uh, because it's non pathologizing and just very much like, hey, here's something. Let's notice it. Let's be curious about it. Uh, like that alleviates or that that has the potential to really alleviate for me all of the pressure to like, be the fixer or be the savior, the rescuer, or like the expert with all of the answers. And um, which is great because, I mean, I, I have an expert professional part that really likes to like, you know, launch his opinion at a bunch of things. And sometimes that part gets stumped. And so it's really nice to be able to just be like, you know what, that part can take a coffee break. I'm just going to like wonder about what's going on with you. And, yeah. and that, more often than not, that, that does get us through the conversation and we find something. So I, I appreciate that. I love it. Yeah. Um, it cool to do like confession in an IFS way. I don't know. I've wondered about that. Like how IFS could inform practices of confession. Yeah. What do you think of there? I don't know. I'm just curious. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like really only a question. <laughs> that, okay that's right yeah <laughs> that that could be good i i have sometimes wondered about like 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 praying for the different parts like like in the way that in ifs speak will often like initiate like internal conversation between like what like that framework calls the self and then there's the different parts and uh sometimes i thought well if you can like talk to them i mean couldn't you pray for them too so anyway i think you probably should probably <laughs> <laughs> yes if someone wiser more talented wants to like challenge me on that i'm open to that but otherwise i mean i i, I like the idea of what was it oh okay so when you were talking about uh oim and working with the youth, you were talking about um centering on way of life and uh, i really love that you you talk about that phrase it's it's a phrase um that uh, i've been using or thinking about a lot in in my own work uh to understand you know healing and sobriety and a bunch of things. But I wonder if you could say a little bit more about this idea of 
way of life, what it is, how you introduce it? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, so one of the things, you know, that I, I feel like when it comes to like faith conversations and particularly with youth and young adults, um, we, we can hyper focus, I think, on, you know, what the church believes about this or what a, someone teaches about that. And, you know, what are our views on, you know, X, Y, Z social issue of the day or um, and it's, it's just really easy to get like caught up in sets of beliefs or perspectives or um, ideologies at, at that point. And to me, like the, the thing that is the most beautiful and fascinating about Orthodox Christianity and Orthodox theology really is simply just the person of Jesus Christ and the way that he shows us to be human, the way he shows us to live. And so my feeling and thought is that a lot of the reason I think that we're seeing so much, you know, loss uh, in terms of numbers of youth and young adults that are involved in the church or that care about faith is because they haven't been shown like a beautiful way to live. Um, they've just been shown a right way to think. And I don't, I don't know that that really has, you know, longevity to it in terms of, um, you know, actually forming the human spirit in, in any, in any real lasting capacity, because there's always going to be some ideology or some perspective or some, like the way that I think now as a 37 year old, is very different than the way that I thought as a 21 year old. Um, and I think that that's probably okay. And I think it might even be good that some of my perspectives on things have changed. Uh, but what has not changed for me is uh, the desire to be close to Jesus Christ, to, to, to be with him, to follow him, to learn to live as he lived, uh, to treat people the way that he treated people. Uh, though That to me is something that is so again and again and again and again, just so beautiful. Like the, the thought to me of becoming like Jesus Christ, to live and die in such a way that I can do so without fear or resentment, like that is itself, you know, the bread and butter to be of, of Christianity, right? Like you too can be free from fear. You too can be free from hatred. Um, that's way more important to me than arguing about, I don't know, whether again, let's go back to the baptism thing, like a baptism by immersion or sprinkling is like actually more important. It's like, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure we can have, there's a place for those conversations, but can we at least begin with Jesus as Lord and like, let's do everything we can to keep close to him. Like, let's start there. Start there and then go from there into, and then what will you do tomorrow when you actually yes. have the world? <laughs> yeah. 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 Ah, I, I love how you, you, hold those two up this idea of um see, leading into this beautiful way beautiful healing way to live versus just here's this right way of thinking and and i remember uh like especially in my you know, my last stop over in in protestant christianity that that became a really frustrating almost despairing experience for me is having a sense of like a very theologically heavy, you know, community and the, the sense I got, and, and of course they never quite explicitly say this, but they, they kind of, they, the implication is kind of like, well, if you disagree with our particular nuance of theology, you're probably going to hell. And, and I was just like, oh, how do I know what's the right one? Cause a lot of them make sense and, and everything. Um, yeah, and I don't want to go, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> I know, I know, definitely. <laughs> well, and when you were talking about it, you're talking about how, uh, you know, you know, you too can be free from hatred, you know, right now or, you know, in life. And the way you're talking about leaning into this way of life is it's not just, uh, well, let me rightly believe this one thing in my head so that someday I go to this faraway place that I may or may not actually understand. Um, but there's a sense of like, no, actually, this way of life starts now here in the body on the earth. And, and it's a very real now thing. And, uh, that that feels like a huge, uh, a very huge shift. Um, so, but being a little bit more curious in there. So, um, so if the if Christianity is centering on the person of Jesus Christ and 
you know, becoming more like him and, and following in his way. I'm curious about what you noticed about your own change process and in you also being able to watch other people in a change process. What tends to be some things that help that? Yeah, I mean, these are these are good questions. And I think they're important ones and probably different for each person. Like there's no, you know, like specific like program, right? Like we, if you, 10, 10 steps to becoming like Jesus, right? Like there's no YouTube video that we could just like make um, that would happen, that would show like some golden path or whatever. Um, and, and even with something like, you know, in the ascetic tradition of orthodoxy, you have like the ladder of divine ascent, right? Which we just celebrated yesterday as the fourth Sunday of Lent. Um, that even the way that we understand that is like, it's not a linear process, you know, like that you are, like you start with one and then you have to go to two and then you go three. Like our, you know, our priest gave a homily yesterday that in like seconds, the Theotokos did all four in the enunciate, like the first four steps, just like that, right? So it's, it, it really depends, you know, kind of like who, who you are. Um, that, that said, I, I do think, uh, that, that there has to be a kind of like a, a framework in mind of, about the, the, the change process and how, how it happens. And, um, I, I've really come to enjoy some of the teachings from like John Mark Comer and his like practicing the way group. Like, I think they're doing some really awesome stuff. Uh, and I, sometimes I look at them and I'm just like, oh man, like we, we need to learn some things from these people. Like they, <laughs> like they're, they're doing the things that we invented and like, we, we should probably start probably redoing those things that we, you know, invented or whatever. Um, but I, I think that the way they, they phrase it is that it's this, this way of, this way of being through embodied practices that center around three kind of core goals. And that's being with Jesus becoming like Jesus, and then doing the things that he would do if he were you. And if we're not trying to kind of like engage one of those three things, then we're probably veering from the way, right? Like everything about this has to come back to either being with him, becoming like him, and doing the things that he would do if he were us. Uh, otherwise, it's not really worth the time. Like I think about like St. Paul, who, you know, literally says things in his letters, like avoid stupid arguments. Like, like, and I love that, right? Like the stupid controversies and the stupid arguments, like he actually says stupid there. And I agree. Like sometimes it's just, we get into these stupid things. Um, well, well, there went but, my Twitter career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Twitter, uh, Twitter, yeah. Twitter, Twitter. Yeah. So mm. I, that's, that is an example of something that I got rid of years ago because I knew it was not making me more like Jesus. Same with Facebook, same with Instagram, like all of it. And like, and really, if that, if that's the question I have in mind, like, is this helping me become more like Jesus? If I have that question in mind, then it's going to help. It's going to really make a lot of decisions a lot easier for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that I always, you know, say choose the thing that's going to make me more like jesus like having that you know like fourth taco like that might not make me more like jesus but it still seems like a really delicious thing to do yeah um so today mm -hmm. i'm gonna do that uh and a fourth taco fourth taco oh yeah bring on all the tacos okay yeah all the tacos all the tacos. tacos yeah do that today because um, then you'll it's tomorrow's tuesday so more tacos so, and okay. yeah exactly <laughs> cheaper tacos cheaper tacos uh, yeah uh, but I, I do think that like this kind of like being with Jesus thing is, is, is such an important beginning place, because if we don't want to like be with him, why would we want to be like him? Right. And, and I think seeing people engaging in um, practices of like silence and solitude, like, like this is a, a major way. I think that we kind of put ourselves in the refining fire of the Lord's presence because there all of our thoughts come out you know like they we we just have to grapple with everything that's inside of us um like the other day i was trying to uh sit down and and just kind of be in some silence and solitude with the lord and i was just so angry i was just so angry that morning like i, I don't i don't know really everything that it was about but like i was remembering like ways that like my parents had offended me as a child I was like thinking about slights from, you know, like different people in my life. And um, I was just like, so just angry. And um, I had to reckon with that 
I had to let it be there, you know, and say like, oh, here's this part of my soul that uh, really needs to experience love and uh, be welcome to the table of, of Christ, because that's the only way that it'll be healed. If I'm ignoring this by numbing it um, through activity, through whatever, I'm never going to be able to reckon with it and sit fully in the presence of God as I am and experience his love for me as I am and thereby become healed and transformed. So I do, I do think that like that's part of the path for us is reckoning with everything that's actually inside of us. Yeah, absolutely. Oh goodness, I mean, when you're talking about that, you know, it's like that's like like every liturgy for me all lately. Yeah. Where it's like, I mean, I, I was I've been musing on this for for some reason. Like, I mean, I well, I mean, have been like a more angry person at various points in the past, but there but there's something about like stepping into the liturgy space where even if I've had kind of like a reasonably kind of like balanced kind of centered week. Uh, oh, I, I get really angry or I get really sexual or I get really just like, mm-hmm. pers- you know, I start perseverating at things or I get really resentful toward my wife for stuff that's like not at all current. And, 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 and I've started to wonder if it's like, is this like, because I'm in a silent space or, mm-hmm. and again, kind of bringing in some of the IFS, you know, jargon, the, the idea, um, kind of, kind of the way that the IFS people understand the person is that there's this, the, the self energies, I mean, they might be trying to talk about the soul, but there's something really pure and attractive about like unconditional, welcoming, curious, compassionate attention. And like the wounded parts of ourselves tend to gravitate toward that, whether it's in another person or in, in, in within ourselves. And so what I'm wondering is like, huh, do these wounded, like angry, resentful parts of myself kind of, you know, non-consciously recognize, hey, we're in the presence of the Lord or we're in the presence of like other holy people. Uh, this is a healing place. And so they just like bubble up and they're like, look at me, look at me. Like I want yeah. healing too. So I'm like, huh, that's really weird. It's super distracting well, and irritating, but I'm like, oh. yeah. As, as I'm thinking about this right now, like I'm just, I'm hearing the words of Jesus, Lazarus come forth, you uh, know, yeah. like that, like it's that maybe he's still saying that to us, right? Like Reese come forth. Like right. come whatever those parts of your soul that are in the tomb and stinky and rotting and you're right. trying to hide behind a boulder, like come forth and let like let me give them new life. Huh. Yes. Parts come forth with your four day dead stench and uh, <laughs> 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 ah, that's really cool. Yeah. Speaking of parts, so it's when you're talking about the talking about the way and being with Jesus, being like Jesus, doing what Jesus does. So I, I confess there is a nerdy 90s christian bookstore part that's like remembering like the wwjd bracelets and like cringing a little bit <laughs> uh and yet uh you know but but just a little bit because it, it does seem like there is something really powerful about that that idea and unfortunately i got like sidelined by this you know kind of goofy christian 90s 90s christian culture trend but um yeah i mean it got it, that's exactly it it got it got hijacked by the christian industrial complex you know, very much so. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm appreciate, uh, well, I definitely do appreciate that more because I think, you know, goofy bracelets aside, I mean, it is a really good practical question to think about. Like, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus think? Um, and I mean, for our, the non Christian listener, I guess you could kind of substitute uh like role model of choice because there are other good role models and whether it's you know here's this other historical figure other spiritual teacher like mentor sponsor someone like uh this is kind of what it means to be a disciple of someone or to be a learner it's like you you find someone who's living how you want to live and you pattern your life after theirs and so you start you know anytime you come to like a crisis point or a change point or a decision point or even just like uh huh i have like an idle 20 minutes what should i do with this you know well what would you know so and so do that i want to be like mm-hmm. and uh so there is something immensely practical about that um and uh i'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on on on, on this what i'm finding is hard about change or you know as a in, in my counseling practice as i'm working with a lot of um, a lot of mostly men who are pursuing sobriety of some sort, whether it's from from drugs, from alcohol, from you know sexual behaviors, from pornography, from a variety of things. Um, there comes a point sometimes where they say, "Okay, so well, I've quit, however many things. Now what? Or mm-hmm. when will I have quit enough? Or like when will I be abstinent enough from so and so to be be okay?" 
And so there's this idea of this more like abstinence-based, subtractive-based change process that uh, has some advantages, but it, it feels very limited because it inevitably leaves this void of like, well, now what do I do with my life? And uh, what I hear you talking about is kind of the, the completion of that is the more additive component of, well, here's what you should be doing. Here's what you should be adding. And um, let's see, where was I going with that? Uh, <laughs> it just feels like it works better to start with what you want to be or what you want to add. Um, I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts or observations there? Yeah. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Got a little frog in my throat today, I guess. Um, how did that saying even get started? A frog in your throat? Like, um, what a weird thing. Ribbity croaking. Yeah, but it's like, I'm not going like that. <laughs> that would make sense. But Maybe. All right, anyway, uh, are you, how, are you familiar with the the work of uh, Kurt Thompson at all? Did he do Anatomy of the Soul? The what? Did he write Anatomy of the Soul? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he wrote a couple other ones, The Soul of Shame and The Soul of Desire. Okay. I read the first one and I read Anatomy of the Soul and thought, mm -hmm. oh, it's like a Christian Dan Siegel. <laughs> you know, it's not... He, he definitely like is very, you know, inspired by... Uh, Dan Siegel's work for sure. Um, and he, you know, in, in his next couple of books, he, he takes things a little bit uh, further, you know, and in particular in his last one, I, I really, really liked that, that book. Um, but what, and, and this is something that I've been thinking about for, for quite a while anyway, uh, is, is the question of longing and um, our, unres our unresolved longings really is being the thing that causes us so much pain and fear and suffering. Uh, the fact that we have these longings to be known, these longings to be loved, to be seen, to be comforted, uh, to be safe. Uh, these are these are deep human longings. Um, and at some point, you know, in our lives, we were denied those things. Like all, all of us are walking around just with kind of like a, a pit full of longing in our in our tummies. Um, and my, my thought is that so often rather than going toward the longing, because to go toward the longing really, I think is to go toward the suffering. Um, I mean, think about really just even what hunger is, right? Like hunger is pain telling your body that you need something that you're not getting. And really, I think that that's what our suffering is, 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 is our soul telling us that we need something that we're not getting, which I think is why we tend to avoid it. You know, like, because that's kind of like we we want to do the best we can to just get away from anything that would cause us pain, because like, understandably so. I don't know. I mean, like, who wants to hurt? I don't want to hurt. Like, hurting is not fun, you know? <laughs> right. So this is then, I think, where we develop kind of like our, um, you know, our compulsions in life is like if I have this longing to be loved, to be known, to be seen. Um, and when I'm angry, I'm sent to my room to be by myself. Then I will, instead of feeling my anger, dissociate from that and like go, I don't know, just try to be super compliant. Like I'll live my life being very compliant, doing what everyone wants, never arguing, just being like, this is, you know, this is fine. I'm happy to, uh, you know, it's better for me to like what I get than to get nothing. So I will choose to like what is given to me instead of not getting anything. Right. right. Um, and, and for some, for some of us, like that's the narrative that we got as kids, like, like what you get or get nothing. And so we go, okay, I'm not going to throw a fit about this. Cause that's not, that part of me is not welcome at the table in my family or in my own. And so I learned to recognize like to push that part of my soul away from even myself right? Like it's not welcome at the table. But the thing is like that anger and that pain is still there. Like it's, the, it, it, it doesn't go away. And so when the invariably starts leaking out, I mean, this is just IFS, right? Like we turn to something to relieve the tension. Like how, like, I don't know, like that extra taco, like that's gonna, that's gonna do the thing that, re that relieves the tension. But really after that, I still, then I just feel gross and bloated and kind of mm -hmm. still empty inside and the yeah. pain still leaks out. 
So I'm yeah. back to my compulsion of being people pleasing. Yeah, part of you is trying to, you know, part of you is really needing needing a hug, an extra hug a long time ago, but still trying to make up for that by like trying to use an extra taco now. Because yes, that's what that part's able to do. You know, parts having limited perspectives, and then like your greater system is able to recognize, oh, the impact. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but but at first isn't able to do anything about it. But but then. But I guess here would be where the change process comes through. I mean, I mean, you see this in your counseling work. I see this where, where uh, bringing awareness to that, bringing awareness to well, what's the mechanism? This you know, extra taco eating part, uh, or I mean, substitute drug of choice, you know, in there, you know, is doing this thing because of these other things that happened before, these other wounds, these other deficits, these other lacks, and what I observe is that gaining an awareness of the system and of the cycles and of the reasons for it gives you a lot of opportunity to begin to do things differently. Um, yeah. You know, kind of a short answer to when people ask, well, okay, why do we need to talk about our past? It's in the past and everything. Uh, it, yeah. Something like this. It's like, yeah, your, your past didn't actually stay in the past. It just went deep underground and it's causing earthquakes. Yes. And, and I think that core to understanding the past, you know, because I, I think we can like so easily get fixated by our own wounds, which is like, I don't know, I, I have two feelings about that. Like, I get it, you know, that, um, you know, it's just easy to get stuck kind of thinking about how someone hurt us or how our parents like weren't there for us or how whatever, whatever. Um, but I think the, the the deeper question, the next question isn't just how do they hurt you, but what did you want? And I think that this is the significance of what Jesus asks his disciples, right? Is what do you want? What do you want? What do you want me to do for you? Do you want to be healed? Like over and over again, we see these questions from him of longing, of desire. Uh, and I think until we get to know and name the desire, you know, it is going to just feel empty when it's a story of subtraction, because then we don't know what we're trying to get. You know, we don't, we can't find, um, until we know what we want, sobriety will never get, give us what alcohol promised. But once we know what we long for, sobriety absolutely can give us what alcohol promised because now we're in touch with the longing, you know, I think mm -hmm. that, I mean, that makes sense to me in some capacity. I think so. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Hearing you, hearing you phrase it that way, I, uh, <laughs> uh, once upon a time, a very long time ago, in a very, very, very different frame of mind, I was looking into help from different sources, and I, I had a phone consult with a shaman one time, um, uh, and didn't actually follow up on that beyond that one consult, um, <laughs> in case anybody's concerned, um, but. <laughs> Um, but I remember like the thing he'd asked me too was like, well, what do you want? And, you know, granted, I mean, it, that was in the context where I was like, you know, trying to fix, figure out like, well, like what you figure out questions about like marriage and sexuality and faith and, and addiction and, and a, bun a bunch of things. And so, so there were, the, and there, were, there was something about that that felt a little alarming, I think, uh, in that like even me being in the super burnout deconstructing like i don't know if i like jesus anymore sort of phase like there's still something about that like uh that narrative of, of like centering myself that felt like uh some something's off here and maybe um i don't know i mean i obviously did not didn't know this person really well and uh still don't but um but there is um, I like, I didn't trust myself fully. Like I didn't trust that going with like what I wanted would be a good thing. Cause I think like the thing that I wanted wasn't going to be good or it wasn't going to be healthy. Maybe as I'm thinking about it, I'm wondering, cause, cause I'm trying to like, you know, mesh that with what you're saying. I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if I didn't want enough, um, you know, referencing C.S. Lewis a little bit. Um, maybe the problem with our desire isn't that we desire too much, but we desire too little. Like, like at that time, I was like, I want independence, or I want sex, or I want, you know, this or that, you know, like, you know, affirmation, or 
uh, almost something like easy and, and, and soothing or something. Um, but what I should have been wanting were the big things, like you're talking, like to be to to be truly loved, truly known, truly seen, um, and truly healed too, which you know, does demand change and does demand work. Uh, you know, demanding you know the presence of God in its in its essence, and and I, and I definitely wasn't thinking in those terms at that time in my life. So yeah, so yeah, because I think that what you're what you're talking about is strategies. Right, like like strategies to get what we want, and you know maybe it's sex that is a strategy to get what I want, or um, you know I mean pick pick any again like you said drug of choice, right? Maybe it's like a great career. It's a strategy to to get what I want, and I think so. It's helpful to clarify because when I say like what do you want, I'm not talking about like a hamburger, right? What what you want is to feel full, like that's what you want. You want fullness. And like, where are we going to find that? Are we going to find that in hamburgers? Are we going to find that in a packed schedule? Are we going to, you know, I, I think that like the deepest longings of our soul are things like goodness, you know, it's like love, uh, approval, beauty, passion, you know, wisdom, safety, security, joy, power, strength, like, you know, comfort and peace. Like these are the longings of our soul. Um, all of which are good things. It's just that when that, you know, we, we then, a la Adam and Eve, right, who were created to be like God, like that's why they were made, to be like God. And the serpent tempts them, saying, if you eat of the fruit, you'll be like God. Now, what, I don't know, and I, it's not really, like that's what they were made for. But like what he's speaking to is that longing that's in them to be, to fulfill what they were made for. But it's the problem is that they define good and evil for themselves. And that's what we continue to do. We continue to define good and evil for ourselves um, instead of having good and evil defined by God for us and given to us, right? So the path to God likeness is that I take this fruit and I eat it. And I think perhaps the path to love is I take this fruit and I eat it. The path to approval, I take this fruit and I eat it. Uh, instead of recognizing that like, goodness comes from god god is love god has already like given his approval of me based on just the fact that he made me like my existence is proof of my approval in god's eyes you know he doesn't he doesn't make things that that he doesn't want so it's like if we redefine it in these terms and this i think becomes like again the path to a new way of life a way of life where I don't have to keep eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and defining good and evil on my own terms. Mm -hmm. What a relief. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, that is usually relieving. Like, yeah, to know that there is already an established path and it can just just follow it. And I think, I mean, how wonderful too to, to recognize, I mean, the desires, the desires are good. Or, I mean, going back to your, your, your hamburger image, um, I mean, I mean, nothing inherently evil about a hamburger, <laughs> uh, but um, oh, I guess I shouldn't talk about that during lunch. <laughs> I know, dude. I, <laughs> just, we'll go back to veg veggie tacos. Veggie tacos. <laughs> <laughs> Extra veggie tacos. Yeah, um, but you're right. It's like like the like like the the object isn't necessarily like the bad thing, or like the hunger is you know, isn't the bad thing, but um, but it can be twisted or or it can be overdone or, or like, and, and here's where I think bringing in, you, you're talking about the, the, the value of silence and solitude, you know, part of that can be to get to know, okay, so what actually is the real thing? Is it that I specifically, like you said, is it that I want a hamburger or is it that I want to be full? Or I would push that even further. Is it that, is it that I want to be full or is it that I want to be nourished? Uh, and, mm. and there could be a lot of, a lot of avenues to that. Or, uh, you're talking about some different things and like you, you'd mentioned like, you know, power and strength. Uh, and I might almost like explore a difference there, but to say there might be a difference there, like to, to, to be strong, to be capable is one thing, but to like have power might almost be pushing that mm -hmm. into like, uh, the, there's, there's like a, like an extreme or an intensity to that. Yeah. Uh, I guess what, what I meant was like agency, right? Like a, oh, like okay, a yeah. sense of, of like agency when, when I was saying power, but power is probably a bad word. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I yeah, but 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 I see that like uh, to 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 desire agency or to desire a, a personal power, you know, may not be a bad thing. 
to desire like control, like dominion over others is like the the exacerbation, the the intensification of that to an mm-hmm. unhealthy degree. Um, which or even yeah, going back to uh, you know, our forefathers in the, in the in the garden, you know, to to want to be like God is a really good thing. And yet even that good desire, you know, could be could be corrupted and taken mm-hmm. down or an avenue it was not meant to be taken down. So yeah. And, and I think like what's what's incredible too about the desire to be like God, and, and I remember hearing this like this. Oh, this was Adam and Eve's problem was that they wanted to be like God, and again, like that is that's the that is the the thesis statement about the human being. You know what I mean? Like that's it. Like that's the the thesis is like let's make someone who's like us, um, and create him in our own image and make them after our likeness. So the desire to be like God isn't it, it's not just a good thing; it is a God given thing. Like That's God what we're meant to do. Gave them that desire. It's like, I want you to want to be like me. Are you kidding me? But the problem is, again, that we continue to redefine good and evil on our own terms. And that's where we get so screwed up. Like, that is where, um, and we've, we've done it for, since. I mean, that's what the entire, like, scriptural story is about, right? Is like people doing what was good in their own eyes. And like, that's the political situation that we're in is people doing what's good in their own eyes instead of, turning to this life, this way of life of following Jesus of Nazareth, of learning from him, of apprenticing under him, you know, of becoming like him and then doing what he would do. And to me, it's, it is, it's just the only, it's the only way to a humanity that is not manipulative and violent. It's the only way. I, I would agree. And uh, again, in different parts, hearing this from the lens of, uh, you know, kind of a mixed audience and then imagining how there's on the one hand, so, uh, there's a lot of aspects to that to, to say there, there is this one way and there can be something really challenging, even offensive about that idea of like, well, why that way? And why not another way? Or I don't want, you know, I don't want the Jesus way. Um, and yet what, what I observe though, is like on, on the other end of that uh, is a, a non-wayness if there's not a way to follow, then you just wander and you're just lost. And and they, and they do observe people who they don't have like any form of something to follow. Uh, you know, even again, even Jesus aside, they, they don't have like any tradition or any, any spiritual sense or any, any particular mentors or any, in some sense, like not even in any sense of like, well, this is what I want to be like when I, when I get older, uh, not, not a clear sense. Uh, And so there's not any way established for a person. And, and so, there's there's just this wandering there's this perpetual wandering being kind of like stuck in longing be like well i'm longing i'm full of longing and i kind of know the longing and all i know is like here's these ways i'm not supposed to meet it and yeah i've done that for you know you know 180 180 days woot uh but uh but yeah i guess i guess what i what i'm appreciating so that yeah these, these very abstinence based methods of healing or approaches to healing, they, I think they are really limited in the scope. And one of the great offerings of the Christian tradition, especially the Orthodox tradition, is to say, no, actually, there's lots to add in. And it's not just more rules. It's more, here's a goal. Here's the object of our faith. Here's, in the Orthodox tradition especially, here's a lot of spiritual practices. Here's the community. Here's the sacraments. Here's a lot of structure and framework that you can step into you know re- ready made you don't have to invent this or create it for yourself or, or conjure it or manufacture it uh you just there's this ready-made flow welcoming you home <laughs> and yeah it's well and, and that's it right like it, and, I, and i feel like this is again one of the things that's uh you know to kind of even tie it again to youth and young adult work and like ministry work and at large is we we so systematize the belief structures of the of of orthodoxy instead of saying like this is an invitation to the table of god to participate in the inner life of the trinity who is love like this is about union with love nothing more nothing less like that's what this is we were made by love and we were made for love um and i feel like without that kind of centerpiece then it ultimately is just like it, it it's a 
I don't know. It's an offensive thing to say, like, this is, this is the way, you know, to go Mandalorian on it. Um, <laughs> which I have not watched the new season, by the way. I don't even, I'm, I'm over all these shows, man. Yeah. Only... Yeah. I, I was aspiring to get to the Mandalorian at some point and then life got busy. So I guess, <laughs> but, yeah, I'm just fully in like ready for season three of Ted Lasso to, to run its course. And like, that's where we're at right now. Riding the right, Ted right. Lasso train. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I remember thinking this though. So, um, me, me and a friend, we watched the new Jesus Revolution movie, and um, you know, on my other show, I'll, I'll have a review of that coming out. But uh, I know, I know, one of my one of my conclusions there was something like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a feel good movie. It's 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 written as a, as a feel good movie, and there's there's because there's because it's has to be written as a movie and not a theological treatise. It ends up feeling like theologically a little, a little sparse. Uh, and my 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 musing was that well, <laughs> so like if like, like if God is not real and like if the spiritual world isn't real and if God is not real and we can't know Him and we can't be healed and change and be like him then like all of this is really silly this movie is just about like you know silly emotional people getting wet and uh and in bell bottoms which i mean i, I really did appreciate the bell bottoms <laughs> um, but um <laughs> yeah but but it really does come down to the central question of like well i mean are these things real or not um you know but if the spiritual world is real then it does have all of the things that we're talking about this potential to really radically invite you into this holy change, very healing life pattern and something to hope in. So, uh, good. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm with you. Like if, if, if I mean, it, it, again, it's like St. Paul, like if, if this isn't real, like pitied are we above all men, Yeah. you know, <laughs> like yeah. stacking our hope on something that's just like so ridiculous yeah um but it's so beautiful that i like want it to be true even if it's not you know what i mean like yeah. like i just there's not i can't think of a better way that i would want to live than like life in the way yeah I just, there is I a, yeah because there is at some point where like, like you judge a thing by its fruit and you can say well so when people live this way and and, and and truly do it, not just like culturally appropriate it or not just like kind of you know, go for the toppings, but like truly embrace the essence of what this way is, they tend to become better people, like the kind of people we want more of. You know, people who are who are kind, who are calm, who are generous, who are responsible, who you know don't abuse the earth, who don't abuse other people, uh, you know, you know, built on a fallacy or not. I mean, that, that, that that's a good way to live. Uh, so there's you can even put on bell bottoms you know you like, can't you even do, the bell, do bell bottoms, bottoms. Like, yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh so one other one other one of the tangent i wanted to take us down just because i mean it is fifth week of lent when we're recording this and and i'd be curious to hear you musings on this like kind of the the combination of of lent and longing because you're talking about how a lot of things center on the things we long for our unresolved longings tend to be the source of our problems the the discovery of like what is it that we're actually longing for what's the proper way to, to achieve that tend, tends to be a thing uh, and it's interesting as we're doing this in the midst of, of a fasting season and for for the orthodox you know christian community kind of the, the longest strictest most strenuous fasting season of, of our year where in a sense we're we're having we're inducing longing in ourselves through going without certain foods um, and perhaps certain activities also or uh, like, like, you know, for me, kind of, I, I tried the inverse this, this time and, uh, trying to, I aspire to, you know, get up and go to matins every morning, not this morning. Cause I'm doing this instead. Um, which is fine. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, and what that's meant, what that has looked like is like, I'm not getting to like sleep or exercise like the way that I normally would. Uh, and, and so there's a different sort of physical longing that I'm feeling of like, <laughs> like I, I really want to just like feel better uh, physically, even as I'm completely loving getting to know the mountain service uh, very well. Um, but I, yeah, I'd be curious as you've been Orthodox longer than me and been, been a counselor and kind of in these fasting, feasting rhythms longer. Um, what are some things you observe? Piece of longing in particular, yeah, or like 
uh, you know, like, like Lent in particular, it seems like it's a season kind of like designed to invoke longing in us. Like, how can we, how can we use that? Well, how can we take advantage of that? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I definitely think that that is like the, the core thing. Right. And I think that the church's wisdom to use food to kind of instinct, like get us there is huge. Right. Because in some ways, like, even if we're, children about like this spiritually speaking right like i can't wait for pasca so that i can eat a hamburger like we're still like having the thought of like i can't wait for pasca right and that like this is the church teaching us to long for pasca and long for like the new life that springs forth from the tomb um and i i think that's great i you know whatever whatever it takes to to get us there and i think that as we grow uh, the depth of our longing is revealed, right? That it, it's it's no longer about the hamburger, but it's like the the deeper thing that that I seek. Um, so as you know, last week we was was the week of the cross, uh, and during the the Wednesday service, the pre sanctified liturgy, uh, I was just like we had the cross out in the middle of our of our nave. Uh, And I was just like looking at it and uh, I was just thinking about, you know, like the two thieves that were crucified with, with Christ and how the thief on his left, the so-called bad thief, uh, you know, turned to Jesus and was like, Hey, if you are really who you say you are, like, get us off these things, like take these, take these away from us. Um, and I thought like how often I've been that person in any number of ways, right? Like just take the cross away. I don't want to do, I don't want to be in pain. I don't want to be dying. I don't want to suffer. I don't want any of that. And I think that's one path that we kind of have through here. Uh, and then the other path is that of the, the good thief who is simultaneously being crucified as wounded and wounder. And I, and he accepts that, right? He accepts that he is there as wounded. I mean, he has to, he's on the cross. Like here I am, you know, I'm being this, I'm being crucified for what I kind of have done, right? Like I, out of my own woundedness have wounded others and uh, destroyed life and all of that. So now here I am both as wounder and wounded. Um, And only he, by accepting those things is able to say to him, like, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, realizing that Jesus is there as, you know, innocent, willing victim. And, uh, I guess like for me to, to recognize that like all of this process is about unearthing like the different ways that we are both wounded and wounder. Um, and that behind that is, is a deep longing for union with love, um, a deep longing for, uh, for, uh, wanting to be seen fully and to be known fully and welcomed fully. Uh, and I thought about that, that like, that Christ says, you know, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's the same thing that's offered to us. Like every time we go to the Lord's table is this full welcome as both wounded and wounder. And what else could we want? You know what I mean? Besides like, I welcome every part of you. Every part of you is welcome to my table. Um, and I will give you rest. I will give you healing. I will, I will give you new life. Um, God, you know, that's talk about stoking the flames of desire. You know, what else, what else could do better <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for me anyway? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I mean, I mean, referencing like, like, like the repentant thief, I mean, and for him, it was very much this like, okay, so, so we're going to die in a minute. So this would be like, you know, after that. Um, but, but like we were saying earlier for us wanting to access that, it's not a, someday when we die thing it's very much a here and now like you can begin to participate in this life right now in the body and live a different way think a different way feel a different way connect a different way uh you know be healed of these these wounds like in in the body in the soul like now so um it is this very like imminent very very practical thing and that's exciting to me uh I was thinking about like when, when you know, when I when I came into orthodoxy, like what was what was some of the draws to it, and and I, when I tell the story, I keep coming back to the sense of like, well, 
it felt useful. Like my, in my Protestant upbringing, like there was something that felt like, oh, this is kind of true, beautiful, inspiring. But like, uh, it wasn't until I found the Orthodox tradition that I felt like this is a useful faith. And this could do some good in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I, and I still think that very strongly. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I don't think either of us would be around probably. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not here. So, that's yeah. good. Cool. All right. Well, maybe that will be a good, good pause point for now as um, we are, <laughs> as of this recording, about to enter kind of crunch time the last few weeks up to Pascha. Although, no doubt, by the time you're actually listening to this, it is after Pascha because just realistically, it's going to take me a while to process this. But uh, I hope it will still be useful. And you can listen to this again next year during Pascha because, you know, we'll still be around. Yes. yes. Hopefully. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, God, willing. God willing, yeah, yeah. Well, the Pascha will be around. Uh, hopefully, we will be there also. But anyway, yes, no promises. But right. the internet is forever; it will yes. outlast either of us, which is terrifying to think about. Indeed. Um, okay, I won't comment on AI because <laughs> that would <laughs> just bring up too many tangents. Uh, but in the oh, meantime... And, and fears. <laughs> too many tangents and fears. Yeah, yeah. No, I know it goes something like, okay, so if one of like like the dystopian AI futures were to come true, are we banking more on like 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 iRobot version or like Skynet version or, you know, 1984 version? Um, which, okay. <laughs> now that we've just been talking about all the, these wonderful, hopeful things... Um, <laughs> Okay, we'll turn away from the despair. <laughs> but, but speaking of the internet, uh, if someone wanted to get a hold of you, Christian, or uh, follow your other online work, uh, where can you be found? Yeah, so uh, you can email me at cgonzalez, that's G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z, -E at voym.org, like the, and then O-I-M theoim.org. Uh, you can check out our website at theoim.org. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at the OIM official. Uh, that's the the place that we exist kind of online. And we also have got some YouTube stuffs. Um, I can't remember the name of our channel there, but you could just search Orthodox Youth Ministries and it'll probably pop up. I think it's also the OIM official. Um, but yeah, give us a give us a look. I don't have any of the like you know personal socials. Otherwise, I would you know plug those. But ain't nothing to plug. So okay, there you go. Okay, so it's the OIM. The O to the wide. The OIM. Yeah. Okay. The only one. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds great. Uh, thank you again for sharing some thoughts and musings and yeah, uh, a long focused longing ramble. Uh, I've been encouraged. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for having me, having me back. It was good of to, course, of course. Good to hang out. Indeed. We'll do it again soon.